So you want to buy a home in Ontario. Cool. But it's not really as easy as get out of Toronto. Where is most of your family? Where are your friends? Where are the jobs? Do you have relatives that may need your help in the future or relatives that could help you in the future? Give the romantic notion of a small faraway town a rest perhaps and think about these real things. I want this video to be more technical and less personal, so I'm just going to leave it at that. I trust you know where and why you want to buy a home. Alrighty, it's time to stop daydreaming and saving aimlessly and do what they call a quick mortgage affordability calculator. So I found a great one on CIBC's site. It's free and you don't have to enter any of your identifying information. So let's say your household income is 70k and you've saved a 50k down payment. I chose a five-year mortgage term here. It's pretty common. It doesn't mean that your home is paid off in five years, obviously. It just means you're locked in for five years and you look for another mortgage after that time. Um, it's August 2020 and interest rates are very, very low, so I put 2% here. That's fine. Amortization is the period of time it would take to pay off the home. Uh, for a newer mortgage, it's approximately 25 years. Now they want to know for some reason what your heating bill will be while ignoring all other utilities. So I just popped kind of an overestimated $200 in there. Debt payments, uh, they want to know how much your monthly credit card and car payments are, things like that, student debt. Uh, I just popped in $300 there. Property tax, you can actually find this on a lot of home listings, strangely. Um, I just looked up the average in Ontario is 256, so I put that in there. And let's just say for the sake of this scenario, you don't really want a condo, you want a freehold home, which means no condo fees. So I just put zero there. Now we're gonna calculate. Cross your fingers. And it's that easy. Let's scroll back up to the top here. So this is the maximum purchase price of a home you can afford. And this is what your monthly payment will be. Pretty easy, right? Let's scroll back down here. Oh, missed it. All right, so it gives you your principal plus your down payment, and then this mortgage insurance thing. So what's up with the mortgage insurance? Well, if you put down under 20% of the purchase price down, you're considered higher risk. You must get this mortgage insurance thing. Don't ask me a lot about it, but basically it's the government saying to CIBC, hey, we believe in these people and we'll cover them if they can't pay their mortgage. To which CIBC replies, thanks man, and stamps your mortgage approval. Also, remember that RRSP that has money locked inside of it? You can use it if you're a first time home buyer. It's called the HBP, and it's the only time other than retirement that you can access that money. So if getting a house is important to you, think about doing it. The HBP lets each individual draw up to 35 k from their RRSP to pay for a down payment, but you must pay that amount back into the RRSP within 15 years. There are some forms, so ask your banker and make sure you have enough time to do it. All right, back to house hunting. Now take that number, in our case, 477, and go shopping. Zucasa. Zolo, Zillow, they all start with Zs because when you're done, you'll have zero in your bank account. Housing prices are based on neighborhood, square footage, number of bedrooms, age of home, a lot of other factors, but basically it goes kind of like this. Freehold detached is more than freehold townhome, which is more than condo townhome, which is more than condo apartment. Let's say we decide on Oshawa. Alrighty, the hunt is on. Let's go on Zolo. Now, here's where the reality kicks in. Crap, I want this house, but I'm short. Don't be afraid to ask family for some help if you're so lucky to have some that can help you. The good thing is now you'll know how much you'll probably need. This is a good point to reassess. Maybe you've come to terms with the fact you can't afford a freehold townhome and may have to look for a condo or save some more. Maybe someone in your household has the opportunity to pursue a job opening that pays a little more that could bring up your household income for a better mortgage. Or maybe you need to save for another year or two or, or seven and build up your nest egg. At least now you know these things. 
Now, if you make it past that stage, before you physically go house hunting, try and get a pre-approval for a mortgage. You don't have to, but you should. A pre-approval is when a potential mortgage lender looks at your finances to find out the max amount they'll lend you and what interest rate they'll charge you. This is the real deal. Affordability calculators are free and they're great and a good start, but you should really know what you can actually get before you spend hours house hunting. Let's see if you can get what you thought you could. Remember, mortgages make banks a lot of money and you're also the customers. Don't be afraid to shop around. You can put an offer on a house without a mortgage pre-approval or an approval. It's just a little bit scary because now you've signed on to a house and have no mortgage. You have to pull the mortgage together before the closing date, which is commonly 60 days uh, from when you sign your offer. So you've got your budget, your pre-approval, and have looked at a few houses online in the area that you're interested in. So far, we've completely avoided realtors, and I'm sorry, but they exist. In most transactions, there's a seller agent representing the seller of the home and a buyer agent representing you, the home buyer. You may think, as a buyer, I don't need to waste money on a realtor. They take some vague but important percentage of my money that I could be saving. And, someone who, and as someone who's gone through this process, I have good news for you, you're absolutely wrong. They do not take any percentage from you, the buyer. All of that money, usually 2.5% for the seller and 2.5% for the buyer agent, comes out of the seller's pocket. What does that mean? Essentially, as a home buyer, your agent is quote-unquote free. The seller pays for it worked into the selling price of the home. You may also think, well, I can negotiate with the seller better if I don't have a buyer agent. Also, mostly wrong. Many brokerages have agreements that if there's no buyer agent in the transaction, the seller, agent, or brokerage takes over most of what would have gone to the buyer agent. It's just not worth the hassle, and most of the time, people go with the buyer agent. When you get an agent, they also help you book properties, negotiate deals, open the lock boxes of houses, etc. Without a buyer agent, you cannot access the houses to see them nearly as easily. We actually tried going it alone without a realtor at first. We got non-responses and pushiness into signing other forms upon meeting seller agents, etc. It was the worst. Additionally, you may not know what's really going on with the whole process, and it feels like you're really alone. Because you're watching this video, an agent may be super helpful for you in that sense. Basically, I don't agree with the system as a whole, but you need a buyer agent to get anywhere, and for you, it's free. Just do it. The agent may get you to sign a document agreeing to stay with them for a set period, for example, six months, and that's completely normal. They don't want to spend 30 hours touring houses with you, and then you end up buying through your cousin Johnny, who just became a realtor. Oh boy. You've got a realtor, pre-approval, budget, and area. Now say goodbye to a few weekends and hello to seeing houses. You'll be seeing houses and throwing down offers, so you're going to need your 20 to 30 k in liquid cash for your deposit when you make an offer. This is put towards your down payment, so it's no big deal. We saw houses on weekends, which worked out well for us, and the system seemed to revolve around showing on weekends. Generally, the desirable homes had an offer date, which meant all buyers had to hold their offers until a certain date. Usually, it was a Monday or Tuesday. Mediocre homes, i.e. older or worse neighborhood, did not have an offer date. If there was no offer date, you could put an offer at any time, usually at or below the asking price. If there was an offer date, you usually had to brace for a bidding war and talk about how high you're willing to bid for the house against other buyers. In our experience, going 10 plus K over asking. The annoying part was, almost no listings uh, listed the offer date publicly seemed to be hidden on the MLS and only our buyer agent could see uh, like what each house's offer date was. There was a rhythm to the process in which we saw houses on Saturday or Sunday, and most of them had an offer date on Monday or Tuesday. It was that fast in this market. We're talking three to five days on the market, sizzling hot. Another note about offers, they can have no conditions. For example, we're buying this house no matter what, or they can be conditional, having one or more conditions. The two most common conditions are financing or home inspection. I don't want to really get into it. Uh, you could talk to your agent about it, but basically very competitive houses rally up a lot of no condition offers. Our agent often said that of the GTA, agents with uh, selling agents that get a lot of offers throw the ones with conditions in the trash. No conditions is so much more attractive to the seller because it says 
I have financing. I don't need a home inspection. You're locked in to buy this house and it's very difficult to back out of. This is valued highly because sellers are trying to plan their move as well. And if a deal falls through, it can throw off their timing and their finances. It's also annoying on their part to relist after a deal falls through, wasting time and possibly raising suspicion among buyers who watch a neighborhood as to why this house has boomeranged back onto the market. You're probably not going to find your home in the first weekend, and it took us about six offers and ten house hunting days before we got our house. It's called hunting for a reason. The first weekend, get a feel for what you liked or didn't. After the first weekend, you may even feel like you're ready to make your first offer, but you probably won't get it. I would say make a list of haves and nice must-haves and nice-to-haves after this first weekend to streamline your search, now that you have a feeling for viewing houses. Our must-haves went something like this. Parking, two bedrooms on the same floor that weren't in the basement, and in neighborhood X or Y. Nice-to-haves, two bathrooms, detached, and a full-height basement. Didn't have to be finished, just full-height. In my experience, newly listed homes were better. If a house in the market we were shopping in had been on the market for seven or more days, even if we liked the look, we made newer listings a priority to be seen. In a super hot market, many, many people have seen homes on the market seven days or more, and they've not been sold suspiciously. Often they're overpriced, or as we learn the hard way, have foundational issues. Again, this can be personal and different for each market. I'm just describing the situation we got into. We got burned by a house that had been on the market for a month, and after signing the offer conditional on the home inspection, we found it had severe and undisclosed foundational issues. In fact, among all of the flaws in the process, this bothered me the most. We caught the issues with our home inspection, which was a great experience, by the way. But what if someone had missed those issues or walked in without a conditional offer and bought the house and it fell down the next year? My heart sank when I saw this house relisted again on the market and there wasn't anything I could do about it to warn anybody except make this video. Basically, that's it. See houses, make offers, repeat. In our sizzling market, anything that had an offer date seemed to be going over asking price, sometimes very much so. Talk to your agent about offer strategies and pricing. After your offer is accepted, you pay the deposit and have until closing to get and secure your mortgage and the rest of the money. Honestly, if that's a 60-day closing, it's plenty of time to shop around. Uh, you also use this time to withdraw from your RSP and get the rest of the funds. If you have a condition like home inspection, your offer will stipulate how much time you have to do this. In our case, we only had five business days to inspect the house and back out of the offer, which we did. That's it. Thanks for watching. Those are the basics from the perspective of me, first time home buyer in the 2020 market. Just for fun though, I want to take you through some bungled offers we made and what we learned if you want to stay tuned. Let me take you through four of the most heart wrenching offers that didn't make it recently for us. Number one. Our first offer, a pawn in the game. We were excited, jittery, and we loved the house. It was beautiful and beautifully staged and underpriced. We thought we'd found a dream come true. We put in what we thought was a competitive offer, 31K over asking. The house ended up having over 10 offers and going 131K over asking. Ouch. It was our first heartbreak and not the last. What we learned. It was then that we learned to look more at neighborhood pricing and comparables instead of asking price. There's a lot of psychology in the asking price. It's a game and we fell for it. Pricing low drums up a lot of offers because buyers can't see any info except how many other bids there are. And it drives up the price when you have a high roller who's scared by the number of offers but really wants the house. We were basically used as pawns to drive up the offer for the high roller buyer. Number two, blind bid frustration. We found a dainty house in a nice neighborhood that seemed like it was the one. We placed an aggressive offer. When the agents were negotiating, they kept saying we were close, but we didn't know how close. It was the worst. All offers are blind. It's like a silent auction, where you can only see how many other offers there are, but not what they are. Our bid ended up losing by just $5,000. What we learned. Take it more seriously when they say you are close, quote unquote. If you like the house a lot, upping your offer by 5 k may be worth it. Number three, bidding against ourselves. This house was a bit of a fixer upper. It was not staged well and needed electrical and other work done, but we could see the potential. I think the seller made a mistake having an offer date on this. It was not a house that would get a bunch of interest because it needed so much work and I was right. We put in our offer on the offer date 
and our agent called a few times trying to find out how many other offers there were. The seller agent was not responsive, even late after the deadline. Then, three hours after offers were supposed to have been submitted, the selling agent tells us there's another offer, hinting that it's 30k over ours. Our agent is skeptical that there was such an offer and worried the agent might be manipulating us to bid against ourselves. Our agent asked for the 801 form which verifies the existence of the other offer and the seller agent could not provide it. Instead, he provided a series of screenshots of sketchy text messages that seemed more like evidence of a drug deal than anything. Scared and honestly sketched out, we didn't pull out of our offer, but we didn't improve it either. It turns out there actually was another offer and we didn't get the house. No regrets here though, it was a really bad situation, made worse by the fact that we were hosting friends while this was happening because we had no idea the situation would drag on till 11 p.m. Number four, the home inspection reverse maneuver. We found a beautiful big house that was well-priced with no offer date. It had been on the market for a month, but I convinced myself it was because it looked like a barn and the aesthetic might put off some buyers. We toured it, loved it, and ended up negotiating an unbelievable 40k under asking. We were thrilled. Because there were no other offers and because the house was older, built in 1918, we put in a home inspection condition with our offer. We frantically booked the inspection and tagged along as it was done a couple days later. It did not go well. It was here we found that there were live wires in the attic, severe bowing in the back wall's masonry, and a crumbling foundation hidden by decks and a bad cover-up job. There, were also, there was also a roofing job that put shingles on top of other shingles and a chimney that was literally falling apart and letting water into the, into the house. We looked into repairs, but foundational issues can be 40k to 100k to fix, and jacking up a house to make a new foundation can destroy drywalls, tiles, etc. in the floors above as the house is straightened. Brutal. What we learned. Conditions can save your butt. We backed out smoothly thanks to our home inspection condition, and though we were down $500 for that in inspection, spending three hours with that guy made us comfortable and confident into looking into red flags in future showings. There's a tip I forgot to mention when seeing houses. Do a walkthrough video that shows all rooms and the furnace, electrical panel, and water heater too. That way you can better show friends and family, pause the video to check out things you missed. It's way better than pictures. We finally found our house in late August 2020. It's a beauty, a little over our original budget. We could tell it was priced low from comparables, and so we cruised reasonably over asking without batting an eye. We were also lucky in the in the fact the offer date was unusual, not a Monday or a Tuesday, but a Sunday, and this may have shaken off some competition. There's a term you may come across called pride of ownership, and it's pretty vague, but it basically describes a house that's been loved. It hasn't been rented out a lot or neglected. It's been perhaps a family home that has been cherished, upgraded, and cared for. That was this house, and it gave us the confidence to risk it for the biscuit. It may seem silly, but take a look in the oven. Is it clean? Look at the caulking in the bathrooms. Is it new? Look for evidence of waterproofing on the foundation. Look at the backyard. Has it been cared for and cultivated or just mown and hastily prepped for showing? I once chatted with a landlord who took quick peeks into prospective renters' cars when they came to see the property. If they can't take care of a car, what are they going to do to my house, he laughed. Similarly here, if they can't recalk a bathroom, what else have they failed to upkeep over the years? Back to our house, though. We heard there were 10 other offers. The seller agent called and said we were close, so we decided to throw another 5k at it. That was all we were going to do. We waited. Then we got the call from our agent. I have bad news, guys, he said. You're going to have to pack. That's literally what he said. I thought I was going to kill him. Overall, happy it's over and happy with the house. We made it and you can too. I know there's probably a lot I didn't cover, but feel free to ask in the comments. And thanks for watching. Little cold cellar for all the wine. And the little bathroom. The littlest sink I've ever seen. It's so tiny.